I'm Sebastian, that's me. I do a lot of open source, and a few years ago, I started the Modulicious project. Today, I will show you what's new in Modulicious 8.0, which should be out in the next few days, perhaps even tomorrow during the hackathon. We'll see about that. But first, a little bit about my day job at SUSE, the Linux company. The reason I'm mentioning this is because every third feature I'm presenting today has actually been developed as part of my work at SUSE. At SUSE, we make various Linux distributions, some free, some commercial, and Mojo is used extensively in the creation of both. OpenQA was the first Mojo project at SUSE, a framework for automated testing of Linux distributions. Every new build goes through the system. It uses more than 300 million workers. The builds run in QMU with a simulated input, and the output, including screenshots, is compared to countless test assertions. It even uses WebSockets to give you a live view of the test runs. And the whole project is open source. This is Kevl, our legal review system, and what I work on mostly at the moment. Every, sub every package submission to one of the SUSE Linux distributions needs to go through this to make sure all licenses are compatible. Thanks to this system, we only need two lawyers to review all our packages, which uh, currently count uh, over 20,000. And all of those are being updated continuously. Um, in the past year, over 100,000 updates. And soon it will be open source too. And the obligatory recruiting slide. But uh, seriously, if you like open source, SUSE is a great place to work. And we have currently over 200 open positions. But now let's start with the new features. First up, we have a brand new logo, thanks to our friends from Styx. This time we wanted something more colorful and friendly. And personally, I'm very happy with the result. It's already live on the site. And it looks great on t-shirts and mugs, as you've all already seen. We do not have new stickers yet, but those should be available soon. Subprocesses. This one was originally developed by Joel as a plugin, but became such a commonly requested feature that we had to make it a core feature. Here, we have a fairly common problem. We have a blocking operation that's too slow to run in the web server but also too fast or uncommon to use a job queue like Minion. Traditionally, the Mojo web server had two types of processes, the central manager process and a few worker processes, handling requests concurrently. Now, we've added another layer. Each worker can have an arbitrary number of sub-processes, which do not affect normal request processing. Sub-processes have two closures. The first here in blue runs in the fork process. Then the result gets sent back to the parent process, where the second closure in red runs with the result. And in a real application, it looks like this. Just make sure you don't uh, ignore exceptions in the second closure. Mojo file, the first of our two new modules. Perl already includes pretty much everything you need to portably deal with file systems across major operating systems. But it's all split up across many different modules with different API styles. Instead, you can now just use the path function and get a very consistent API. It's a container for file system paths, and you can use it to extract information such as the individual parts of a path or the names of the directory in file. You can also manipulate the path to generate new ones, like children and siblings. Methods can be chained to create directories and files. You can list all files in a directory, recursively or non-recursively. And yes, these methods return collections of module file objects. So you can make really cool one-liners. Aside from the path function, there's also tempdir and tempfile, which create temporary directories and files for you. 
they support all the same methods and are destroyed once they go out of scope. And there's many more methods I've not even mentioned yet. Unix domain sockets. This one can be very useful for um, connecting to reverse proxies. It's a little bit faster than uh, playing TCP sockets. Just use the new HTTP plus Unix scheme when declaring your listen location. And be aware that every slash in the path needs to be escaped with the person 2F. And yes, it also works with the user agent, but the default host header will look a little bit strange. <coughs> so just set a better one manually. Configuration overrides, a very small feature that can completely change how you test your Mojo apps. I'm sure you've seen this before. A Mojo app that uses a config plugin to change something in a template. Very simple. But how do you actually test that with multiple configurations? I'll give you a moment to think about it. In 7.0, you probably won't find a good answer, because I couldn't either. Now, in 8.0, we have config overrides. So you can completely ignore config files for testing. You just pass along a hash when loading the app. And that's it. These two tests can even be in the same test file. System D logging. Say what you will about system D, but logging with journal D is pretty great. You might have seen this before, a simple system D task file to deploy a Mojo app with the daemon. Default logging is not bad, but things like the redundant timestamps take up half the screen, which is not so great. So we've added a new option, short logging. And now you get this format. If you look closely, you can see that we even use native systemd log levels, which gives us color highlighting and the ability to filter our logs. Roles. For many years, we've been looking for a generic extension mechanism for module classes. And so far, our recommendation has mostly been to use local variables as methods. You might have seen this example in the documentation. Fortunately, in the past few years, uh, RollTiny has pretty much become a standard in the Perl community. So we are making it an optional dependency. And the example from before should now look like this, much cleaner and easy to reuse. The roll flag uh, can be used to, uh, instead of the usual roll tiny boilerplate. And all Mojo classes have a with roll method, which you can, lose, uh, which, uh, you can use um, to load ro uh, roles on classes and objects. These two calls are equal. Plus location is just a shortcut. And all of these examples are actually already on CPAN, ready to use. And I hope uh, many of you will add more. Promises A+. Plus. Probably the biggest new feature. There are many ways to implement promises. And Promises A+, plus is the standard used uh, for JavaScript promises. We've decided to adopt it because anyone working with JavaScript will have to learn it anyway. And it's really not too bad. So in 7.0, you would use continuation parsing style APIs like this. A closure would be passed to the get method and then called at some point in the future. 
Now, in 8.0, we have new methods with an underscore p upended, short for underscore promise. It does exactly the same as uh, get methods, uh, as the get method before, sorry. But instead of accepting closures, it returns a promise for a result in the future. Promises have three states. They always start out as pending, which means they have no value yet, and later transition to fulfilled or rejected, with a result or an error. I know this is a little complicated, and we're still trying to find ways to better explain it. To access this result or error, you always use a Zen method, which accepts two closures and returns a new promise. The follow-up promise receives the return value from the green or red closure, whichever ends up being called. And now the tricky part. This return value can also be another promise, in which case the follow-up promise acts as if it was created by our get request, the get underscore promise method. You might have seen uh, these deep nested closures with continuation passing style before. They are often referred to as callback hell. Promises might look a little complicated at first, but they are great for avoiding this problem. Instead, you can now just make flat promise chains. The promises created by uh, our GET requests simply get passed along the chain. And the best of all, you only need to do your exception handling once. If any one of the promises in the chain fails, they all fail until the next catch. And the catch method is just a shortcut for calling the then method without the first closure. These two are exactly the same. Now, you might be wondering how to build your own promise APIs. All you have to do is uh, create a new promise and then, at some point in the future, call its resolve or reject method. And that's all. And now you know the basics of how promises work. There are a few more methods, but uh, they don't add any new concepts. I hope this helped a little bit. I would love feedback after the talk about how to explain promises better. Subroutine signatures my personal favorite feature in the past 10 years. Sadly, Perl signatures are still experimental. So you, have, uh, you had to use this boilerplate in the past. Now, in 8.0, we've added the signatures flag to module base, and it will take care of the boilerplate. Even in the future, when signatures are no longer experimental, this will still just work. And, of course, it also works for light apps. And for one-liners, it is now activated by default. So this just works if your version of Perl supports it. Timing help us. I imagine this is a feature none of you have heard about yet. Shut up. <laughs> so far, it's only supported in Chrome. But it's really cool. If you've ever optimized a web application, you're, fami you're probably familiar with the network timing tools. Recently, Chrome has added a new section for server timing. And here you can see CPU and Postgres. But where, those, uh, where do those actually come from? <coughs> it's a new HTTP response header called server timing. And it looks like this. There you can see CPU and Postgres with their respective values. And since we really don't want to build those headers manually, we have a few new timing helpers. Timing begin starts a timer. And timing elapsed takes the time that has passed so far. So you can call it more than once. And finally, timer serving server timing generates the actual header. But these new helpers are not just for Chrome. 
You can also use them to collect data for your log files. It's actually what we use for the modulus logs now, internally. So you get all the same tools. Placeholder types, a new routing feature. What will the route look like to match only these two requests? I'll give you a moment again. Maybe something like this. Now, what if you also needed to match put requests for the same routes? It would look like this. But things are starting to get a little verbose. So as an alternative, you can now add placeholder types. Here we call it Futurama. And things become way more readable. Of course, they also work for regular expressions. Secure user agent. OK, this one might cause some of you a little trouble, but we had to do it for security. You're probably aware that Mojo ships with a built-in SSL certificate for testing. It's not very secure, but all browsers will warn you when you open a connection. Now, our user agent will do the same. And you will start to see error messages like this for self-signed certificates. So if you want to connect to insecure servers with HTTPS, you will have to use the insecure flag. Of course, there's a shortcut too. And we've decided to use a K flag, consistent with CUL. And it's just the same with the user agent module. Just set the insecure attribute. Before server start. It's been a very long time since we've added a new hook for Mojo plugins. This one gets emitted right before the web server starts. So you can use it to reconfigure your web server or to collect diagnostics information. And that's actually what I've been using it for. This is the new server status plugin. You can install it from CPAN. It shows all active connections of your workers and what, you, what requests they are currently processing. And thanks to the hook, you can do this yourself now. Request ID. This feature we've been considering for a very long time, but it wasn't easy to get right. So in the end, we went with the most minimalistic implementation possible. There's just a new attribute with a reasonably uh, unique default value. And so every request now has an ID. And you can see it on the debug pages. and in the logs. And if you want to use your own request ID, maybe your load balancer already generate them for you. Just use a hook to set it. Cpanel JSON access. This one you might end up using without even noticing. Mojo JSON is about three times as fast as the JSON module that ships with Perl. But there are much, much faster alternatives, like cPanel JSON access. There's a pretty good module on cPanel that monkey patches Mojo JSON to use cPanel JSON access. But it needs to be loaded before the web server starts, making deployment very hard. So we've decided to support cPanel JSON access natively. If you have it installed, Mojo JSON will simply be faster. 
And that's it. Everything else should work mostly the same. Mojo PG. Our spin-off projects are of course also part of the 8.0 release and have gained many new features. But wait a minute, what is Mojo PG actually? I've never officially announced this module, so let's start with that. This used to be the code required to perform an async query with Postgres and Mojo. I'll give you a moment to read it. So last MojoConf, during the hackathon, we started working on a better solution. It took a few months, but I think we succeeded. What you see here is a Postgres URL used to configure everything and an async select query returning a promise. This works mostly the same as the user agent, which you've seen earlier. The DB method gives you access to a connection pool, since only one non-blocking query can be active on a Postgres connection. You have to use separate connections to perform queries concurrently. Of course, it also supports blocking queries. And you can use placeholders simply by passing more arguments. And what you get back is a result object. Result objects work the same for blocking and non-blocking queries. There's various methods for receiving the returned data from your query. The most important ones being arrays and hashes, which both return collection objects. When you combine all of this, you get a very nice domain-specific language that also works great for one-liners. Writing the same repetitive SQL queries over and over can be fairly annoying. So we've decided to also adopt SQL abstract. Especially for common CRUD queries. These new methods are very handy. Of course, they also work non-blocking. So there are underscore promise variants for all of them. And since SQL abstract is a little bit limited regarding the SQL it can generate, we've added our own little Postgres specific extensions. The most useful one probably being limit and offset, which I've tried to get into SQL abstract core, but has been rejected. So only we got it. But there is quite a bit more for you to discover, like upserts and joins. And since it's all still DBI, you can easily trace the generated SQL. Pops up. A feature not many know about. Postgres is not just a traditional SQL database. It also has message passing features, which you can use to communicate between servers. A very simple but powerful feature. There are only two methods which you use to receive or send messages on a named channel. It's very convenient for things like distributed chat apps, which is actually one of our new examples. And it only takes 33 lines of code. Migrations. Maintaining database schemas can be one of the most annoying parts of using an SQL database. So we've added a very minimalistic migration system based on raw SQL. Migrations are just text files containing SQL queries with special comments containing a version number and the words up and down.
These migration text files can be loaded from the file system, data sections of classes, or plain strings. You can migrate up and down from any version to any version, and all migrations are transactional. That means if you made a typo and one of your SQL queries is invalid, your whole migration will fail. So you never end up with a broken schema. So if you use the eval command to manually migrate, you would see an error like this if something went wrong, like the very obvious typo there. Minion, my favorite spin-off project. And I think it's still very much underrated. Postgres, what could that be about? Last MojoConf, <laughs> I announced that Minion would be using MongoDB as backend, which turned out to be a huge mistake, and I won't bore you with the details. So we switch to Postgres in the meantime. In fact, we're using our own MojoPG module and take advantage of as many Postgres-specific optimizations as we can. But Postgres is not our only backend. In fact, you can add new backends yourself. Just implement a class containing these methods. There's very good test coverage, so it's not that hard. Some have already done this, and you can find backends for these, mod uh, these databases on CPAN. SQLite being currently the most reliable one, and a very good alternative to Postgres. My favorite feature, the admin UI. It does not require a whole lot of code. Just load the plugin and you're done. And then you see this dashboard. The numbers and graphs all update in real time. You can always see exactly what your job queue is doing and has been doing for the past 24 hours. You cannot just list all the jobs in the queue. You can also retry, stop, remove, them right from the admin UI. And introspect data associated with the job just by tapping on it. And the same goes for all workers. Concurrency. Aside from Postgres, maybe the most important new feature. The old minion worker wasn't very smart, and, you could, uh, and it could only handle one job at a time. So you pretty much always had to start more than one worker. That has changed, and now every worker can handle an arbitrary number of jobs concurrently. The default is four jobs and you can change it with a flag. Job results. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Jobs can now have results. You just call the finish method with a value that can be serialized with JSON. And that is all. You can introspect results from the admin UI. Or retrieve them from anywhere in your application. All you need is a job ID. Job dependencies. This one was contributed by Joel for Server Central. A fairly common problem. Imagine you have three images that you need to resize and then package. To do this efficiently, you want to resize every image in a separate background job and then run the pack job once all three are done. That's what job dependencies are for. You enqueue your resize jobs and the follow-up pack job together at the same time and use the parents option 
to declare the relationship with job IDs. Now, the packed job can only run if its parents are finished. In the admin UI, you can see the parent IDs and even use the relation menu to navigate to parents and children of the current job. It's like a graph of relationships. Remote control. This one took quite some time to figure out. You can use the job command to reconfigure your workers remotely. Here we tell worker 21 that it should process 10 jobs concurrently from now on. And you can see from the admin UI that the job setting has been changed. You can also broadcast commands to all workers, not including, uh, by not including a worker ID. Here we tell our workers that they should stop a specific job, and all of them will try. And you will see a result like this in the admin UI, because one of the workers was successful and killed the job. Of course, you can make your own commands, too. This is how the jobs command was implemented. It's very simple, in essence. Last but not least, foreground. A very nice debug feature that I'm using a lot at work. Here we have a job that always fails but it also produces a warning, which might contain clues that we could use to debug the problem. Unfortunately, only the real error message appears in the job result. No warnings. So, now we can use the foreground flag to run a specific job again, right in this terminal window. And we can see everything. We can use debug tools, all the normal tools we would use to debug a Perl script. And debugging gets very simple this way. And that was the 8.0 release of Modulicious. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have questions? Um, so I think uh, Joel has something for you before we do the questioning. So uh, it's a small gift for our uh, <laughs> uh, loving, loving, uh, That is awesome. Something he has wanted for some time. Thank you and very much. Our appreciation for the great, uh, what delicious framework he's given to all of us. So. Keeps you warm in the winter in Germany, I guess. <laughs> that is perfect. <laughs> Excellent. So, are there any other questions? Has any thought um, gone into reducing the number of dependencies that need to be built and installed for Minion? Because I, I'm using Modulicious on a very low power platform with a small number of developers and the amount of work that needs to be done just to prepare the system to run Minion is... Um, which dependencies are you most worried about? Is it, is it the SQL abstract? Because uh, Mojo PG pulls those in. It's, it's been a, so long since I've tried, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I can't tell you the list. I know that Mojolicious is yeah. trivial. Minion Core doesn't actually have that many dependencies, but um, it depends on Mojo PG currently, which pulls in SQL abstract and a very long chain of dependencies. We might make those optional. Thank you for the feedback. We will consider it. But aren't there alternative backends? 
There are, but uh, the core minion package still depends on Mojo PG. Yeah. I mean, are you are you primarily interested in um, Postgres? No, SQL. Okay. Yeah. We can make that better. Other questions? Uh, hi. I always wondered why do we need uh, the task and queue argument for the job? We, what, what is the difference between them? I think they are... The task is, um, yeah, the essential class of the job that maps uh, to the closure. And the queue is more like a routing key. Um, you can have like uh, multiple pools of minion workers, like you have paying customers, then uh, you would make a queue for paying customers only, and then enqueue your job with the, the, with the queue name for the paying uh, customer worker pool. So they get better service, stuff like that. It's more like a routing key. Yeah. When I tried uh, to implement Redis backend, uh, I stuck uh, that mm, in PG, it's very easy to query uh, queue and uh, task uh, because, uh, b because we have... Uh, SQL. And in Redis, it's uh, harder and uh, it became slower. Yes. And, and we, we are aware of uh, that trade-off. It's, uh, it's a conscious choice. Our primary target are SQL databases. So, so we can have uh, many more features. We, we will probably never be able to really optimize Minion for Redis. Uh, maybe uh, that's an idea. We need uh, something like Minion Lite for NoSQL databases, which will uh, have no, which will have less features, but can work faster for uh, very high loaded projects. Um, that's a very, um, very valid reason to make a fork of Minion, and I wouldn't be opposed to that. But Minion Core will be uh, will keep to be tar will keep targeting SQL databases. Yes, thank you. All right, anyone else? Five more minutes for questions, if something. All right. <laughs> One more question about Minion. Uh, uh, can we? Uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, for, for example, situation, I want to uh, send messages uh, to my, for example, monitoring system or Telegram chat or Slack or something like that. If task fail and uh, engineer can uh, try to figure out why it failed and um, fix it. So how can I uh, find out uh, that the job was failed without using dashboard and see it in my eye? Mm, there is an event. There is uh, an event that gets emitted for jobs that fail. You could hook into that and um, just add a notification system, any, any Perl code. I'm if you want to know more, um, we can talk about it later. Thanks. I can show you an example. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, if, if anyone else can think of any questions later, I'll be around all day. So, just poke me. All right, thank you.